Hollywood, it's just like, oh, you know, he's that crazy guy talking to near-death experiencers. I didn't want to lose all the work I built. I, one day, I just said to God, you want me to do this? I'll do it. There's things much larger behind me that are, are doing things. And there's something inside these conversations that people are connected to, are drawn to. Of course, I've heard the concept of a near-death experience going towards the light, the tunnel, and all that. One of the biggest lessons I've taken away from doing those kind of conversations is many of them come back with some sort of new, rejuvenated mission in life. Finding that thing that drives you. So if you can find something that's larger than yourself, that you are being of service to others while following your own bliss, that, I think, is the key to happiness. Welcome back to the Inspired Evolution. And today we have with us inspiring our evolution. This is such a treat for our soul, for the next level of our soul. Alex Ferrari. Alex, how are you there, brother? I'm good, brother. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm a big fan of what you've been doing and putting out into the world, man. So thank you for the work you do, man. Oh, man, it is so humbling to receive that from you. Your podcast is truly one of my favorites. For those that are tuning into Alex for the first time, two seconds, let me do the honors. He's an author. He's a blogger, he's a speaker, he's a consultant. He's the host of the number one filmmaking podcast on iTunes, which was called the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, and an award-winning director. He's had 25 years' experience in the film industry, and he has actually produced or been part of, helped screen 500 international <laughs> films over like these film festivals. Like, man, I wanted to start with... You have such a depth of a background in film and so much has happened in that space for you. And you've evolved over time into your inspired evolution has led you to having this incredible, or I don't even know if having is the right term because you speak a lot about channeling and we'll get into some of that today. What came through you is this Next Level Soul podcast, which is actually doing incredibly well as well. So you films already had you going in an amazing cadence and trajectory in the world. And you've now ended up with this spirituality podcast. And I've heard you say, if I asked you this question 10 years ago, let me ask you the question. If I would have asked you 10 years ago, Alex, you would have potentially the number one spirituality podcast. <laughs> what would you have said to me? <laughs> I would have said, what are you smoking, sir? And can I have some? Um, because that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But to be, to be fair, I mean, 10 years ago, if you would have said I was a podcaster, period, I would have said, what's a podcast? So, uh, I mean, it was, I jumped into podcasting eight and a half years ago and I, I mean, I'm as surprised as anybody else of where I am in life. Uh, let alone podcasting in the filmmaking space, that kind of made sense, you know, in the filmmaking and screenwriting space, interviewing, you know, Oscar winners and actors and directors and, and writers. And I get that. And that makes some sense, still a little wonky, but makes sense. But if you would have told me that I would have the show the size that I have right now in the spiritual space, talking to quantum physicists and ancient civilization, you talk about ancient civilizations and channelers and psychics and near-death experiencers and all these things, I would have said you are out of your mind. So it is, it is divine intervention at its finest, sir. Quiz, what was the impetus? Because you've got this background in film and starting a podcast, even with filmmaking, seems like, you know, there's still creative pursuits. So I can see that there's a link in there. But still, podcasting is a very different medium to everything you'd been doing uh, in filmmaking up until that point as well. So what was the impetus to shift there? And then a second question to lead on from there at the same time, which is a bit uh, greedy of me to ask two questions in one shot. <laughs> um, the spirituality then, how did that open up as a podcast as well? Like both questions, yeah. So I was kind of burned out from the film industry uh, in 20... 10, 20, 2011, I'd been working on so many projects and I was just really burned out. 
And I had this bright idea of opening up an olive oil and vinegar gourmet shop in Los Angeles. And my wife was just done. um, She was just done having my twins and we were, you know, had newborn twins at home and we're like, Hey, why don't we open up a retail shop, which we have no experience in. And uh, I think we're going to make millions. So we did this and we're locked into it at least for three years. And it was the three toughest years, uh, what three of the toughest years of our lives together, but my life physically, I mean, doing farmer's markets and, you know, events. And it was just a, you know, quote unquote, ball busting uh, three kids, years. Two oh my God. I mean, don't even one, get, I, one is a lot, don't, two at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> I, I just, it's insane. It was insane. It was, it is stupidity at its highest. But during, during that time, I, during the last year of that, I was already looking to pivot because I was like, I got to figure something else out here. And I read a book called The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. And that book reignited my understanding of online businesses because I actually had an online business in 98. I had, I had a website and I was making money in 98 at the birth of the internet. Uh, I have, I mean, I have YouTube videos from 2004, 2005 before Google bought it up still, believe it or not. So I knew about the online business, but I had been away from it for so long that I kind of was scared of it. But then I just start for a year. I read every single book from Gary V to Seth Godin to every, 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 all the, all the usual suspects, all their books in regards to online marketing, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then I said, well, I'm going to open up a podcast. Uh, and I go, well, I guess the, the most, the one that makes the most sense is filmmaking. So it was started that way. And again, it was an insane idea. I thought I'm late already. There's already other podcasts in this space. What am I doing? But I'll give it a shot. And within three months, we were the number one filmmaking podcast and stayed there ever since uh, because of my uh, just ridiculous amount of work ethic and hustle, just pumping out content like nobody, nobody's business. And your your film knowledge and your film knowledge. Like the conversation is really interesting, bro. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, it took a while before I could get any of these big guests. Actually, I took, I was already, I think it was, Oliver Stone was the first big, like monster, giant you know, you know, person I had on the show. And I, I, I always try to point out to people, he goes, he was episode 425. So it took a long time to get to that place where I was a good, I wasn't an interviewer. I still not an interviewer. I'm just a guy who likes to talk. Um, I'm not a professionally trained. I don't know anything about any of that stuff. But anyway, I started building that that show up, and then I built another show up on uh, screenwriting as a as a fluke because I'm like, who the hell is going to listen to me about screenwriting? And that turned into another number one show. So I was like, all right, well, I guess this is what it is. And then I then I kind of retired from uh, the post production, and I kind of retired from the film industry in many ways, and started doing podcasting full time. And then I would just go off and do my own movies when I wanted to, and you know, do projects that really interest me. I wasn't really hustling as much anymore to keep food on the table. And then uh, fast forward to 2021, I'm already six years in, six and a half years in, very well known in the filmmaking space. Um, and I have a spiritual guide of mine. She's been with me for 25 years. She's been on the show. I just recently released a show a few months ago about her. Um, and she turns to me and she goes, Alex, it's time for you to start a spiritual podcast. And I said, I'm sorry, what? What? And she, and she's like, yeah, it's a spiritual podcast. I go, me, I mean, why me? Like I know, I, I say I have no street credibility, like in film, I'd been doing this for 20 years. I had shrapnel. I had, you know, experience. I, I haven't been meditating for six years in, in a monastery somewhere. I have no experience in it. I mean, I've, I'm fairly well read. It's something I've always been curious about. I've read a lot of, a lot about in my own personal journey, a lot about different religions and different philosophies and different spiritual teachings and so on. So I had, I guess, a little bit more knowledge than than the normal folk. But again, just seems like such a stretch. It just seemed like me. I mean, if the universe is going to pick somebody to do this, me? Really? Like this, it it made no sense to me. 
She's like, yeah, you have to do it and you have to do it in three weeks. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? She's like, yeah, you got to release it <laughs> in three weeks. I go, in three, you want me to start a brand new podcast in three weeks, get guests, a, a, a name for a show, uh, a website, I mean, everything in three weeks. She's like, I go, that's impossible. She goes, it is impossible for everybody else, but not for you. I'm like, all right. I learned a long time ago not to argue with you. So I did. Three weeks later, I had a show. I had a few guests. And uh, and then we were off and running. And then when we were, as the show continued to grow, and it didn't grow, by the way. It took it. It, it wasn't like a, a, an instant hit by any stretch. I had two guests that really kind of, I posted it on YouTube. And just, you know, I knew enough about YouTube at that point. And you know, I was I was polished enough. I had a system in the team. So I was able to do editing and everything. So I, I got the system up and running. But it wasn't, it was a slow thing. I was doing maybe one a week. Then I went to one every other week, which is if, you know, if, if you know my, my, my current content strategy, uh, one every other week is probably not, he's not really into it. He's not really pushing hard. But then all of a sudden I got this guest, um, a friend of mine calls me. It's like, hey, do you want the lead singer of Iron Maiden to come on your show? I'm like, I'm sorry, the lead singer of Iron Maiden? I mean, will he come on a spiritual show and talk about that kind of stuff? He's like, sure. So I had him on. That episode was the first episode that kind of took off on its own. I wasn't even paying attention. I was busy doing my filmmaking. So I just, every every few days I'd go on YouTube. I'm like, oh, that's nice. There's like a few more, oh, a couple thousand views on that one. Boom. It ended up getting to like 100,000 or something like that within that first six months. And then I had another friend of mine, Daryl Anka, who's a, a channeler. Uh, he's the only other guy I knew in, spi- in the spiritual world. I'm like, hey, you want to come on my show? He's like, yeah, sure. And he came on and that episode started to take off on its own. Again, very kind of like very distant, like, oh, it's nice. But I was doing it more as a, I was enjoying myself, but I wasn't, I couldn't take it seriously because it was just like, it, I couldn't, I couldn't, I could not get my head around me doing being this, that <laughs> doing this work. It just, it took me, it took me a year or so or less than a year before I, I really jumped in. And it was Christmas around Christmas time of 2021 where my spiritual guide, she said, um, listen, man, if you don't do this, the universe is going to find someone else. Something and I wanted to talk to you about today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just like if you don't if you don't do this, some they're gonna find someone else, and so either poop or get off the pot. So I was like, wow. And by the way, I had stopped for four months. I just stopped completely because I got scared. I was very scared of, you know, from you know, coming from Hollywood. It's just like, oh, you know, he's that crazy guy talking near death experiencers. I didn't want to lose my my all the work I built. And honestly, it was my livelihood. It was the only thing I was doing at the time. So I yelled out I, one day, I just said to God, I sat down after that conversation. And I said, okay, you want me to do this? I'll do it. I'll take it seriously. I'll build this little set that you see in behind me right now. I built this little set. I get a, I got a separate computer. I'll get a camera. I'll do it right. I'll, I'll take it seriously. And I will have faith that you will protect me and my family and provide for both of, for all of us. And I am not. I'm going to, I'm going to walk off the cliff and I'm, I'm praying that someone's there to catch me. Um, and that's exactly what I did. So I started off in January. We had 800, 850 subscribers and, uh, we are currently pushing 537,000 subscribers. Yeah. Over, over half a million in a year and change, like almost two years. Well, yeah, I guess in almost two years now. Uh, which is pretty explosive growth for yeah, it's for any YouTube like, channel, let alone I was let alone gonna say inarguably channel. the fastest growing <laughs> spiritual podcast line that is online, and it's amazing to feel into how much you felt into to have to be able to do that, like on a spiritual energetic level, like you had to have a chat to your maker about yeah, uh, just going hey, yeah, I, I had to because it was you have to understand it was so far outside of my comfort zone. Like I was completely out of my comfort zone. I like I'm like, I'm enjoying my conversations. I'm talking to near death experiencers and channelers and things. I'm getting it. I, and I have a good time doing it. Even those episodes that I did originally, the early episodes, 
I'll re-release them now. And they still hold. It's not like I wasn't doing a good job. I just inside couldn't, my ego couldn't get out of the way. Uh, the mental, the mental, uh, the, what's the word? The, the framework that I built for myself, the, the mask that I had worn all these, yeah, my identity that I've worn all these years, I couldn't, I couldn't break free from that until I finally got shooken up by, by her. And, and then I just made the choice and I went from one episode a week to two episodes a week to three. And then now we are currently doing four new episodes every week, plus some re-releases. Uh, and then it just started going. And again, didn't really take off. We had a blip in July of that, of last year. And then October, actually two, oh, a little bit past the day. It was October 12th last year was our first episode that took off. And then the episode behind it took off. And then we went from, I think we went from 75,000 views in a month to in two and a half weeks, we did 1.2 million views. That's how fast it, that's how fast it took off. And then every month it just kept growing. I'm like, what's, 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 I don't know what's going on. And that, and this is a big lesson for everyone listening. I come from a world, at least in my experience that I needed to control everything. I needed to try to hack the system. I got to get into Hollywood. I got to control this. I'm a director. This is what we do. So we, we were controlling the image. We're controlling the story. We're telling the actors what to do. We're telling, you know, that's the world I come from. So I was always trying to figure out the algorithm and how does this work and how does that work and really try to hack it. When this took off, it was, the, it was an example to me of like, oh, I, I have, I'm not doing this. Because I have no idea why it the episode I'm doing that, that took off is the exact same I did six months ago. There's just nothing different. There's really, I'm not doing anything different. So then the universe kind of took me for a ride and then it just kept happening again and again and again. And the growth just kept going and growing. And I'm like, I don't, I, I, I don't know what's happening. And it's not me doing it. It's not like I can point to like, well, I did this and I did that. No. So that's a really good point. And that was when I really learned the lesson of like, oh, there's things much larger behind me or around me that are, are doing things. And if you just get out of the way, things become a lot easier. And that's a, that's the biggest lesson I've learned from the show. Man, that is huge. I love that so much. The, the ode to surrender, like, yeah. And it was a big thing for me as well. Cause when I initially started my podcast, people were like, you should start a podcast. And I saw all these experts doing a podcast and I was like, Oh, I'm not an expert. I'm just perpetual student vibes you know, and there's massive resistance in me. And eventually I just had this moment at 4am in the morning. I was like, fuck it. I'm buying a podcasting course and I'm just going to do it. <laughs> and it was like, but I remember that feeling of surrender and hearing you share just brings up the exact same feeling in my gut. I can feel it. it's like, oh yeah, surrender. It's so uncomfortable because it makes no sense to your identity. And that was one of the topics that I wanted to cover with you today as well, because it's, it's really interesting because from the outside looking in, there seems they seem so disparate, filmmaking and spirituality, right? Especially when you start looking at the superficial level of filmmaking, right? You start getting into like the the cheese of Hollywood, pardon me for putting it that way. But, you know, there's that level oh, of cheese. I agree, with, like, you. Oh, there's I agree with you 100. Oh, yeah, plastic wow. surgery and all this sort of stuff. But when you like park that cheese for a second and you get deeper and you just start looking at, okay, in filmmaking, we're telling stories. Yeah. And spirituality, I've tried to contemplate this a lot, but spirituality in many ways is helping us figure out the character that we're assuming in life and the story of our life and the way that we're living and finding meaning in the story of life. Story seems to be this nexus where the two are actually really joined at the hip. I don't want to take the words out of your mouth, but uh, mouth. But maybe you can tell us about um, an Indian yogi that talks about when he first went to the cinema and looked back at the projector. Maybe you can we start there in this conversation around the nexus between the two things, and we can expand it from there. Yeah, one of my great teachers of of my life has been Paramahansa Yogananda, and his book Autobiography of a Yogi is the book that really kind of. Um, introduced me to a lot. It opened the door to a lot of things for me. I read it once in my 20s. I, I, I couldn't even finish the third or fourth chapter because it was so far beyond where I was. 
that I just put it on my shelf. I've read other spiritual books. Your mind really struggles with that book, doesn't it? It's, yeah. Well, if you're not ready for it, it's, it's just, you know, I couldn't comprehend concepts of like yogis, you know, levitating and, you know, being in two places at the same time. And, you know, the eternal, the eternal saint Baba G who's still hanging around in the Himalayas and he's 25 or hundred years old and all these kind of things. You just could not really grasp it at that age. At least I could. not But then years later, probably in my late thirties, early forties is when I read it again. And I was like, Oh, and it just kind of exploded. It opened up a lot. But one of the things he says is, you know, when you're when you're in a movie theater, you look up on the screen and there's death and there's violence and there's love and there's hate and there's laughter and all this. And everyone takes it extremely seriously uh, because it's but it's just images being flashed on a screen. You shouldn't be focusing on the image in front of you. You should be focusing on where the light is coming from, the projector light that is projecting them onto the wall. That is the focus of life, is to go back to the original light of the projector that we are all being projected onto, on from. So I thought that was such a beautiful explanation uh, of life in general, you know, essentially saying that we're in a quote-unquote simulation and we're all play. I mean, Shakespeare said we're all players on the stage of life. Um, and it's so true. I mean, now it'd be, we're all avatars in this giant video game that we're playing. Uh, and we all agree to certain rules and ideas and we interact accordingly and so on. So it is, it is pretty powerful. Uh, but I agree with you on story. That story is the greatest, um, teaching tool that we have as a species, Without story, we we wouldn't be where where we are today. Yeah, sure, it's fun to go watch a movie or read a good book that may not have meat and potatoes in it. It might just be fun. But there is inspiration. I mean, look at H.G. Wells' books and how many millions of people were inspired to become scientists, researchers, engineers because of the science, science fiction aspects of his books. Uh, and then in other stories that we hear all the time. But yes, yeah, stories are extremely powerful part. And I do believe truly that there is a responsibility with storytelling that you, whatever you put out there, do something good with it. It doesn't always have to be, you know, Pollyannic. It doesn't always have to have a story. It could be a violent story because guess what? Part of the simulation, there is violence. I mean, we're going through a really difficult time right now in the world with two wars going on that are horrific. So it is part of the narrative, but how you say it, the themes behind it, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to put out there? You know, at the end, you watch Goodfellas. It's a fantastic, one of the greatest movies ever made. But there's a moral coil, moral story to that. Don't do this. As <laughs> like at the, don't do, look how they shiny all ob- end up. Shiny object syndrome. <laughs> yeah, they, they look at how they all end up. I mean, so, but it is a, a very violent film, very rough film, but it's part of the story. So those are the kind of stories that I think that I think where we're all going towards. I think the stories of 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 the past. I think people are starting to get a little disillusioned with it. And if it doesn't have something behind it, and you can tell if it doesn't have something behind it, people are not as interested anymore because we're evolving as a species. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I found that recently as well because I, I grew up on a lot of Bollywood, actually. I never really had Disney. I grew up in an Indian family, so Bollywood was this, um, yeah, was my, my Disney growing up. And uh, equally as fantastical, I would say, as Disney, <laughs> to be honest, you've got actors jumping off eight-story buildings and landing on their feet and then oh, running and chasing I've seen some. I've seen some of those clips of those, like, rip-offs of the Terminator or Transformers. Or Indian. <laughs> They're the best. The best. <laughs> The best. What's that one? R, the one that just got nominated for an Oscar. R R F R R R. Or uh, you know what I'm talking about? It just got nominated for best foreign picture because it's like a guy's like wrestling a tiger and he's got this big hairy chest and he's running and I'm like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. What is happening? <laughs> it's amazing, and then, amazing. And then every 20 minutes we'll break out into song in the middle of for wrestling no reason. <laughs> 
no reason. Like he like they're flipping around. <laughs> Some guy like shoots an arrow. He grabs it in the air, turns around, throws it back at the guy. Guy is killing, and then they're like, ah, da, 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 and they start dancing. Yeah. Like, what is happening? <laughs> He's, this is amazing. Uh, this is the greatest in- thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, what is happening? It's incredible. And the more I start to tune into it, the more I realized they're they're actually catering to a family affair. Like Indian, like the entire family goes to the cinema and it's like this entire experience sure. for everybody to go together. And so there's a bit for everyone, you know, there's music, there's dancing, there's violence, there's a humor, there's stuff for the kids. It's incredibly rich. I mean, yeah. I, you know what? But as they say, you know, when you try to appease everybody, you eventually end up appeasing <laughs> no one. I mean, because it's just like, can you yeah. imagine like in the middle of like Terminator, if there's a song and dance number, <laughs> like it's it, not a, a song sequence. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> Choreographed. The, um, there was this, cause for me also, like there's a, there's a couple of spaces that your, your channel forays into that I started getting really, or I've been really curious about and I've been watching some videos on this and, um, yeah, the, like I'm still settling into my awareness around this. And one of them, the first one, is channeling. Because I, yeah, like I started tuning into channeling and it seemed super woo-woo, right? This idea that, you know, I'm just going to open myself, or well, not me, but an individual who is a channel, open myself up and I'll download a current of information to come through, I guess is the loose sort of definition that I've got. Maybe you can correct it if it's wrong. And I was like, that's super woo-woo. And then I started looking further into, well, thanks to your groundedness, I was like, oh, Alex also pairs this to kind of like storytelling. And you mentioned before, like the podcast was, you know, it's going to come through you. If you don't do it, it's going to go through someone else. The idea that story writers are also like when you've you've asked them where their stories come from and it seems to be a bit of a channeling experience if the podcast didn't come to you it could have gone to someone else can you explain what i'm trying to like understand here a little bit for the audience because sure. i think it's a really grounded interesting mystical sort of space to start tuning into and open yourself up to yeah well coming from a creative world and being an artist myself you wonder where the ideas come from you know, and I was, I was, I have someone coming on the show in the next few weeks who is uh, one of the biggest showrunners. I mean, he did uh, Home Improvement and Roseanne and some and really big shows. Uh, and he's now in the spiritual space. And we had this conversation of where's, where do these things come from? Uh, and then he also takes it to the next level. What happens to all the ideas after you die? Like, where do they go? Like, if you have a bunch of ideas that you just never got to put out, where do those ideas go? Do they die with you or do they go back into the ether? And I think it was, uh, it was, I have two stories that great illustrations of this. One is Steven Spielberg, who would say that when an idea came to him, he would move on it very quickly because if he didn't get, like, he's like, if I didn't do Jurassic Park, it would have probably gone to James Cameron afterwards in the ether. The, and he would have done because he's capable of doing it. There's a handful or Peter Jackson, or there's a handful of directors who can bring this story to light in the way that it needs to be brought. That Jurassic Park's not coming to me in 1991 because I was in high school. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for that idea to be presented to someone like me at that time because I didn't have the resources, experience, or talent to put something like that on screen. To be to arguably, Spielberg barely had the technology was barely available to get it done. Yeah. I mean, even then they were going to do it like old school. So it was just on the bleeding edge. So he says that, that that ideas come up and you kind of see that with movies where all of a sudden we have five movies about asteroids hitting the planet. But before then we had none, like yeah. none, and they're you all know, or at the same time as well. Yeah. 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 yeah right. Yeah. yeah. Like the, when the matrix came out, there was another movie that came out called uh, the 13th floor which had similar themes, big studio movie, similar themes, but The Matrix was just a cooler film and took off in a, in a different way. But those, there, you can, you'll start seeing momentum like that, especially in cinema or in pop culture, ideas will start popping up. So right now, a big idea that is talked about very freely now is the multiverse, which Marvel's doing a great job of explaining that. I mean, the Oscar-winning movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, is about the multiverse, about parallel realities. 
these are ideas that have been talked about in the Vedic texts for thousands of years that we are in multiple, there are multiple realities. And then you start getting into the Mandela effect and that's a whole other conversation. And you, there, and so, but these things are talked about now, but like in the eighties, are you kidding me? Like you talk about a multiverse that was super geeky, super sci-fi, but now it's something that is talked about all the time. Even the word channeling is something that is in the zeitgeist. Like, Oh, I'm channeling Michael Jordan right now. While when he made that shot, I'm channeling this person because I did this. I'm channeling Shakespeare when I wrote that. It's a, it's an idea that is, that it is kind of come and, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Oh, the other story was, I think it was Michael Jackson. No, it was Prince. Excuse me, Prince. Prince uh, Prince used to love a calling, uh, recording. He he left, I think, so much music that he can release a new album into the year 3000, literally. Like there's a new album of Prince every year into the year 3000. That's how much stuff he recorded in his lifetime. So he would just call his backup singers and his musicians like at three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, hey, I got something. Let's go. So he called up his his he called up his backup singers like, hey, it's it's Prince. You gotta come. He's like, it's it's four o'clock. Can this wait to six? He's like, no. If I don't put this on, if I don't record this right now, it's gonna go to Michael Jackson. So he even was at a at a level that like if this cool idea came in, it would it would go along in the ether to someone else. So ideas are presented at the time that they need to be presented to the world. The The idea of the iPhone was not presented in 1737. It, it, it's just, it wasn't an idea that brought, the internet, the internet was not, did not that idea did not come into play in the 1400s. Like that, even the, even if you try to explain it in their terms, it would it, you wouldn't have been able to get anywhere with it. So that idea is not going to come out. So that's why I think now so many things are happening so fast is because we are, as a species, as a consciousness, elevating ourselves more and more every year. I know it looks a little crazy in the world right now, but to be fair, we are more conscious now than we've ever been, at least in this cycle, uh, of our existence <laughs> as a species. You know, it's, it's just you can kind of see that where there's open communications about this, there's this kind of conversation about spirituality that 20 years ago did not exist. It just didn't exist. Imagine in 1990s, if I had a show talking to channelers, you know, Oprah, Oprah took forever for her to start talking to psychics and mediums and things like that forever. And she already was Oprah by the time she started doing it. She didn't build her, she didn't build her empire off of that. So it's, it, when it, when the time is right, these ideas will start to come into play, and I think shows like yours and mine, these are the, this is the time for it. This is a time. Ten when I would if I would have started this show in 2015, because I know you started your show in 2018, something like yeah. that. Yep. So it wasn't too far behind. End of 2017. Yeah. Tw- yep. Correct. Exactly. So you've seen the shift in just watching for the last five years. How much? There's so much more competition, so many more shows talking about this, so many more near-death experiences, more all channelers. It's in the short five years and in the short two years that I've done it uh, in this space, I've seen a shift growing very, very rapidly that people are, and I could just tell because of the numbers of my show. I mean, the numbers of my show are so, so kind of crazy. And I don't say that in an egotistical way. I just say, I'm like, really? Like that episode got a half a million or that episode got a million views? Like, okay. It's so people interesting when want you look to hear about that, that stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah I think... Go on. Go ahead. I'm no, go ahead. saying like even I was I was literally just doing this exercise literally just yesterday. I was looking at um my lifetime views and then my twenty twenty three views. And they were literally half and half. Like the whatever's happened in the last ten months is the same in volume as what happened in the previous five, six years, five years, Mm -hmm. five and a half years. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, whoa, like the appetite for this is just literally like, it's just starting to grow more and more and more and more. I wanted to ask a question because I do think it's a really powerful question to ask, which is where do our ideas come from? And I love what you're sharing in that there is an ether 
and that, you know, the ideas are there for the taking or there for the receiving, I should probably say, is probably a better way of putting it um, if we're open to it. But also we live in a very information rich age now <laughs> with the internet and there's ideas that our mind pings a lot. And is there a level of discernment in your opinion that's required between what's just a, oh, I've got an idea about coffee and I'm just going to build, you know, something around coffee? Um, or like, is it an intuitive sort of hit? Do we have to learn intuition a little bit? Like what's the... um what's the discernment between an idea that's coming from the ether versus an idea that's just sort of pinging around in my head because it's what's in my immediate environment. Oh, like opening up an olive oil and vinegar store that you have no experience whatsoever doing that kind of idea. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah, wasn't, that, kind of that wasn't divine. <laughs> that wasn't divine, brother. I tell you that um, it did, it did, it did actually, it was part of my journey and I needed to go through that. Uh, but it was definitely not a divine idea that, uh, you know, wasn't an original idea. Let's just put it that way. Um, yeah, I think there is a difference because there is, and it's just a feeling. You see, when you have mental ideas, like you, you, you can be thinking about like, yeah, you know, I'm going to make money, so I'm going to go do this and I'm going to go do that. That's generally, generally speaking, not divine ideas. It could be, but it, generally not. You know, and you see, that's what people are selling on YouTube constantly. All these quick, you know, get quick, uh, rich schemes and, hey, work from home and make no money and YouTube is going to pay you to do this and that. Like, come on. It's no, it's not. It's, it's always no. Um, but when you have these kind of larger ideas, things that are bigger than you, um, that's when things start to make more sense. So when an idea like, hey, let's make a, there's this I, this story that Michael Crichton's writing about bringing dinosaurs back in today's world. And, and Spielberg just heard it and he's like, I need it. And he grabbed it before it ever, he, before it ever was released, he had the rights done. It's just done because he knew where this was going. He already felt it. He, that was such a big idea. It was such a monstrous idea that it brought it brought everyone back together. The Matrix. That idea of simulation theory, that's simulation theory, among a thousand other things that are going on in that film, but it's simulation theory. That, and it's basically explaining Maya or the Great Illusion or the dream in Aborigine, the Aborigine uh, background, the, the Great Dream. This is not new, but... They just put cool kung fu in it uh, and, and told a really cool story, you know, and they had some nice visual effects. But it's the same. But that was a very powerful idea that was so big that it was bigger than them. And they're great filmmakers, but they on their gravestone, it will be The Matrix. You know, I, I mean, regardless of all the other great films they made, it's going to be The Matrix because that idea was so powerful that it needed to come in. So I think that when you feel it inside one and two, when the idea is bigger than you or challenges you in a very large way, pushes you out of your comfort zone, it doesn't have to, and we're talking about very grandiose ideas that are like world changing ideas, but it could be as simple as like starting an inspirational podcast or starting a spiritual podcast when there's a thousand other ones, you know, there is no reason for my show to do what it there just really isn't. I mean, yeah, I can argue that, yeah, I have a personality that people like or or they like the way I do things or they like the guest I have on or whatever. You could argue all of that. But on paper, it made no sense. I mean, it made no sense for me to start a filmmaking podcast in 2015 when there was 20 other ones going on. Like what was special about me doing that stuff at that time? So it's if it's something that pushes you out of your comfort zone, challenges you in a very large way and you feel you have to feel it making money you know trying to figure out a way to make money you generally don't have a an emotional like a like something in your gut that gut feeling yeah there's no electrical charge to that it's very superficial again it can be different but i'm just using that as an example yeah. because there are you know great empires that were built that are helping millions and billions of people around the world. So there is that. But I'm just saying, generally speaking, these ideas that are much greater than than you uh, in your world, I think is a real way to dis discern 
whether it's something that's just bumping around in your eye, in your head, like starting an olive oil and vinegar show, um, or if it's something a little bit bigger and pushes you a little bit harder, which is like start a spiritual podcast in three weeks. <laughs> your work ethic, Alex, is this something you've always had as part of growing up the way that you are in the industry you've been in? Like, um, ham to the wall sort of thing or is it something you've had to cultivate over time tell us a little bit about what yeah how you identify with your work ethic well my work ethic has been like that since i was a kid i was doing uh garage sales selling stuff on the side of the road when i was 10 or 11 to to hustle money i was a very well off 11 year old very well off i was like i had a roll of 100 100 bucks 200 bucks in my pocket you kidding me in the eighties, I might as well just, I might've been driving in a Rolls Royce at that point, but I always worked hard because I came from a family that worked hard. My grandfather, my grandfather is a self, is a self-made man. Uh, and I gained a lot of inspiration from him and how he, you know, basically built him his life up, uh, against all odds. So I always had that, no, that work ethic And it's something that's very interesting and it's something that it's something I I haven't talked about a whole lot, but this is something I've, I've run into my work ethic and this concept of the hustle is it does you well for a long time, but at a certain point, there's a tipping point where that starts to hurt you because you are working yourself to the bone or you just keep going, you keep going, you keep going until you burn out. There is a balancing point that if you don't, if you're not careful, you can burn yourself out. You can crash and burn. You can destroy whatever you're trying to build. There is a balance. And I bump up, I bumped up against that so many times from when I was just, when I just moved to LA, I took any job that walked in the door, any job, the worst job, the and I would undercut, I would, undercut, you know, like, yeah, I'll do your whole movie for five grand. I don't care. And when it's normally 50, like I would just do it to work. And I was killing myself and burning myself out so much that uh, it hurt me at a certain point. And I came into that world with, with my shows because, you know, at a certain point, you don't have to do so much anymore. Like the machine, like next level souls, but I can come out with one a week and very comfortably and it would still do well. I can come up with two a week. I don't need to do four brand new episodes a week. I do it because I want to right now. And I have a system in place that it's not, I'm not doing a lot of the heavy lifting. I'm just basically recording and having great conversations. But before I was doing everything, I mean, I was editing it. I was uploading it. I was the graphic designer. I was, I was everything where now it's a little bit different, but I'm very conscious of that right now. And it is something that and I'm still battling with it, by the way. There's still there's still stuff that I'm I'm learning how to delegate. I mean, because when you're a one man show, when you're a one man show for most of your life, it's very difficult to let go, um, because they're like, oh, no one could do it better than me. Nah, I'm the best. I know I could ever do it. And then you start letting some things go out. You're like, oh, it's okay. It's 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 all right. It's okay. Uh, but like Tim Ferriss, I think was the one who said it the best. Is like, yeah, I get an eighty percent out. 80 to 90 percent close that's that's that you're hitting a home good enough is good enough yeah good enough yeah. is fine. is it perfect no but it's more than enough and good enough to get the job done and that's where you have to kind of let go but yes that's where the work ethic comes from and it's something that i it is a great blessing and a curse all at the same time mm, i love that thank you for sharing that i think it's really important to receive and yet yeah, the um the thing about the good enough was also a massive lesson for me because I'm identifying as you're sharing, which is when you release control on something that you're focused on, even if it frees up 20% of your bandwidth and someone else can look after it for you and it's only 80% good enough, you can now afford 20%, you know, back to the channeling conversation to download something else, to focus on something else, you know, to be present to something more. They can actually move the needle a little bit differently, you know? So yeah, I, I'm picking up what you're putting down. I'm, also conscious, you know, you've, your podcast, this is the other space that I mentioned before. There's, you know, the, the channeling space and the other space that I think is really profound that it dives into is these near death experiences. And 
there's a lot of questions I could ask about this, having tuned into the various different types of people and all the different types of near-death experiences that happen. But I guess for the audience um, here tuning in, maybe it's worth sort of just throwing in a bit of like a, I don't know, like a bit of a tantalizing piece in. What are some of your favorite or what are your most interesting stories slash lessons from doing so many episodes with people that have come into contact with the other side. Um, yeah. What's maybe one of your most interesting stories for you that's really stayed with you. And what's your one big takeaway from that? And I know it's probably a very unfair question to ask because they're all such dynamic stories, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th- there isn't one, I mean, I could, I could rattle off five or 10 that are like, you know, that'll bring you to your knees um uh if if i wanted to but i think the big overarching idea of a near death experience i feel that you know before i of co- of course i've heard the concept of a near death experience you know, going towards the light the tunnel and all that that's been in the zeitgeist for a while now but i really never got into it until i started talking to them and it's fa- it's fascinating to hear where they were in their life how it happened why it happened um, and what happens when they come back? The biggest thing that I've seen in all of them is everyone comes back different. No one comes back, generally speaking, and does the exact same thing. And by the way, it could be delayed. They could repress it for a decade or two. But at a certain point, that experience does come up because it's just too big of an experience for it not to. So everyone comes changed. And generally speaking, everyone that I've spoken to, and I've done over a hundred of them at this point, is that they are connected. They're, they they lose a lot of their anger. They lose a lot of their traumas. Uh, they are more connected to the earth, more connected with their diet, they're more connected with people. It, it just makes them, I wouldn't say a better person, but a different person uh, without question. I think the one thing that I've, one of the biggest lessons I've taken away from doing those kind of conversations and generally almost all the kind of conversations I do on my show is that I have such a knowing and understanding of the other side, meaning that I'm not an expert on it, but I have an understanding of what happens. So there's no fear anymore. I have no fear of death uh, whatsoever. I, I truly don't. At this stage in my life, I would be upset because this is not the time I'm supposed to go. I got a lot of work to do. I got a lot of things I've got to do. So I've, you know, I have a mission. I have a work that I have to get done in this life. But at a certain point, that mission will be over, just like it was for Yogananda. Not that I'm comparing myself to him. I'm just using it as an example. But Yogananda did what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to bring meditation and yoga to the West. Fairly large mission you know, in 1920 to Get see a, a really swami walking too. around. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Hollywood seeing a swami walking as well. the streets. <laughs> Are we on a set? No, this is him. <laughs> this is him. When no one had ever even seen an Indian person, let alone someone of his magnitude. So, and when, but when he had finished doing that over decades, he was here 30, 40 years, 50 years, I think, doing that work. It was time for him to go. And he's like, I'm done. I'm good now. I did what I was supposed to do. This was my mission. And I'm out. And hopefully one day I'll get to that place in my life where I'll be like, okay, I'm I'm good. I've done everything I needed to do. I'm I'm out. So understanding that sense of mission, which all of them, many of them come back with that, by the way. Many of them come back with some sort of new rejuvenated mission in life. And and it doesn't have to be grand, it doesn't have to be huge, but it's something different. And I think that is the biggest key to happiness in my eyes, is finding that thing that drives you. And it has to be a thing that's bigger than you. It can't be just like, I'm going out to make money today only. If that's the driving factor, that will wear thin eventually. It might work for a while but it will wear thin eventually because at a certain point you can only buy a house or a box to live in. That's so big. You can only buy so many boxes with wheels that take you from point A to point B. There's only so much of that. Uh, That's a car, by the way. Uh, (laughs) There's only so much of that kind of stuff that you can, you can continue to do. So that's, that's not it. So if you can find something that's larger than yourself, 
that you are being of service to others while following your own bliss. That I think is the key to happiness. And I think that's one of the lessons I've learned from all those near-death experiencers. I love that. And isn't it something, there's also something to be said in there, I feel, and your work is an exa- like exemplary example of this. When you are following that something bigger than you, the quality of what you produce is different. And it's not just like quality, like you looking at it, nice camera, nice gear, nice conversation, but also the the essence, like the, the intangible, you know, like you said, it's the same conversation and six months later I'm in a different energetic space and boom, like things are starting to take off. You know, the quality um, through and through, like from a really integral place is just different when you're, giving way to something bigger, right? You know, you know, what's interesting is, you know, there's an energy when you have a conversation with somebody. That's, uh, that's a given. I've, I've, I'm mean, yeah. after I've done, I don't know, I've done 1400 <laughs> episodes at this point in my life. A couple. <laughs> a couple. A couple. Uh, episodes <laughs> over all the stuff that I've done. Um, so I've, I've talked to a lot of people. There's an energy and people feel it. People feel it. And I will have a conversation with somebody on the show and I will know without a shadow of a doubt. I'm like, oh, this one's going to go. This one's going to take off because of the energy of what we were talking about. And I'm not always right. As far as like, I I don't pick notes. It's not that I'm always, when I say it, this is going to go, I'm almost always right. Sometimes I'm surprised. I'm like, oh, I guess people really wanted that conversation. But there's an energy exchange. So like I just released an episode yesterday that she she's a psychic from the UK. And we I mean the sec she came in like a freight train. Like a freight train. And I was just like, okay, we just buckle up. This is gonna be fun. And we had this wonderful conversation of just like back and forth, and it was beautiful. But the energy of the conversation was so potent that I was like, oh, this, this, thing, this thing's going to go. It's going to go really quickly because of what she shared, how she shared it, the comfort level she had with me. She was a fan of the show, so she was really excited to be on the show, and she made sure everybody knew about it. Um, she's wonderful. Her name's Nikki. And that episode, I think we pulled in, and I don't, I don't want to say numbers, but we pulled in a lot of numbers in the first 24 hours. It's a good, it was a good episode. And I was like, yep, I, I, I knew it. And then I go that, and I and I can probably call the shot, and I go in about three or four months, that'll probably be at a certain level, because I can kind of sense where that's going and where where people are going to pick up. So there is an energetic level. There's something inside these conversations that people are connected to, are drawn to, and it could be. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. You've seen people who who come on your show that go gangbusters on your on your show. But they put the same person on another episode, another show, and they've got 500 views. And you're just like, wonder why that happened. I'm like, am I that different? It's, she's saying the same thing. She's saying the exact same. It's pretty much the same conversation. Maybe I ask a couple different questions, but what's the difference? And I argue always is the difference is the host and the energy that the host brings to the show. You know, and you and you have such a great energy to your show and, <laughs> and to what nice. you do. <laughs> no, but you do, you do, without question, man. And and that energy is addictive. Sometimes, it's, you know, it's in, it's it's infectious. It's a fa- infectious is the word. Um, and people are drawn to that energy, and not everyone is. Some people were like, "Oh God, this Alex is freaking ridiculous." Like, oh God, he's. <laughs> I hear it all the time. I hear. It. <laughs> I'm not beloved by everybody. Surely not. (laughs) I am not beloved by everybody, brother. Trust me. I read my comments. Um, So it's not that. But to the people who you do connect with, you connect in a very deep way. So Mm. that I think is, is, um, I forgot what we were talking about. We went off on a tangent. Yeah, yeah, but yes, no, I no. Do. It was perfect, I, the I, energetics. I, 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 yeah, it's, the ener- it's all about, it, it really is yeah. about energy. And that's something I feel, I've realized. Mm. I feel like there is so much ground left to cover in this conversation, but I'm conscious of how much time we have left. And I want to wrap things up by honoring you um, because the the podcast Next Level Soul has done an amazing job um, 
specifically on where we just left off around the NDE conversation, the near-death experience conversation. And for those that are curious, I highly recommend checking out the playlist on your channel for near-death experiences because, um, well, amongst everything else that's on the channel, but specifically that because it's helped me realise almost this journey that we go on, which is, you know, and I love the name Next Level Soul because we're soul, then we're baby, then we're toddler, then we're child, then we're teenager, then we're adult, then we're elder, and then we're soul and then again. We're earth, and then we're earth you know? again. Yeah, yeah. And then we're soul again. You know, and this do you want, that's been a really beautiful. Some... Yeah, go on. Yeah. Do you want to hear where the name came from? Yeah. I I had that three week window. Don't forget. Yeah. I had a yeah, three week yeah. window to launch this entire thing. To download and something I went, hot. <laughs> I was like, so I swear to God, this is what I did. I said, I, I jumped into a meditation and I said, hey, God, you know, if you want, if you, I was always challenging the universe <laughs> constantly. If you want me to do this job, I yeah. need some help. I yeah. need some help. So if you want me to do this, this crazy podcast, send me a name that I, that no one else is using, that I can get the URLs for, that I can get a trademark for, I could do all that stuff, send me something. And I went into my meditation and all of a sudden three words just popped into my head, next level soul. I was like, oh, that's good. That works. It was, I was like, check it out. And I, and that works. Thank you. And I just, and I looked and I looked it up and I checked and I checked again and I checked again and I was like, I guess no one else is using it. All clear. I guess I, I'm I, all because in the spiritual space, that was my biggest thing. Like in this, everything has been taken in the spiritual yeah. space. Like it's just yeah. such an abused industry. Everyone yeah, has 50 something. Inspired something. evolutions, to be honest. <laughs> I, it's so many different. I mean, it's so hard to find a name that's original, that sings, that people connect to. And it just popped in into my head. I was like, okay, thank you. And I'm like, I guess you want me to do this thing. So I'll do it. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons my, maybe why the show is doing as well as it is, because I'm just still kind of in shock about it all. You know, it's not like I'm like, I'm still kind of like, really? Like it's, 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 I'm just, I'm just a curious guy asking curious questions, trying to figure out why we're all here, what we can do better, how we can grow, how can we evolve as as souls, uh, as human beings on the planet, what can we do to help others? Th these are the driving factors of why I do what I do. Um, but I bring me to that, to that table, you know, my humor, my, you know, my sarcasm, uh, you know, the energy that I bring is something that is unique and not a lot of it in this space. I've noticed because spirituality is very serious. It's very, you know, it's very serious. You, see, you can't, it can be that way. Not always, but it can be very, and I'm like, that's why I talk to channelers. I'm like, so when you heard voices, did you think you were going crazy? Like I, I say that to almost every single channeler I talk to. I'm like, you know, so when, so when you died and came back, when you came out of the near death experience closet and started telling everybody that you went and saw God, did you lose your job? Did you, did your family not talk to you anymore? Like these are, because wouldn't that be like the first question you would ask? Like when you first started hearing voices, did you not think you were nuts? And what makes you think you're still not nuts? You know, like these are, but you do it in a fun, playful and, 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 and respectful way. But one of my, one of my favorites. Questions. Yeah, one of my favorites yeah. is uh, you just be talking about something deep, profound, and then, <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's like, yeah. And then, you know, spiritual ego is like, but just, just so we're clear. I'm the humblest. <laughs> I'm the, I am the, by far. Alex, Alex, stop it. She's in the middle of such an epic point. And he's like, but just, just so we clear, I do that I'm the humblest. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, no one humbler than me. If there was a Mount Rushmore of humble, of humble. I'm the only, I'm the only face on there. I'm the only, only face on that Mount No question. You kind of, uh, that's just who I am, man. It's just like, you have to, you got to kind of tell I those. Love it, Larry. It's, so good. it's not even, it's, so it's not even planned. It's just comes, it just comes off the cuff sometimes, but yeah, I'll do that sometimes. I'm like, so what you're saying is we're all really Mario and we're all trying to fight Donkey Kong, and get to the princess, right? That's what you're saying. I'm like, yeah, that's simulation theory. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh man, it is such a joy to tune into your podcast and to share this time and space with you here today. Man, thank you so much for doing this with me and with us and our audience. And I know from a fact that actually our audience loves your channel because on our channel at the back end, it tells us that people love our channel and the very next best channel that they love after ours, well, after ours, but those that are watching our channel are watching your channel. So there is a great symbiosis here. And I can tell in this chat why, man, I love spending time with you and I'd love to do this again with you if that's okay. But for now, I've got to let you go. I'm going to thank you for being and sharing your time here today, but also, man, yeah, I want to thank you bigger. Zooming out, like it takes so much courage to trust and surrender to the signs and, you know, you've got a massively epic, successful career in film already and then you've brought yourself to spirituality and podcasting and just the ripple effect of how much impact your work is having in the daily inspires my evolution all the way through bro so i just want to thank you for being you and doing the work the way that you do man it inspires my evolution and all of those around you so so much love and gratitude for you brother same here goes the same goes for you my friend thank you for all the amazing work you're doing in the world to raise the consciousness of the planet so i appreciate you my friend and anytime man just give me a call we'll do it again thank you so much for watching this video all the way to its end obviously you absolutely love this podcast and i want to thank you so much for watching this all the way through here is another video that's perfectly curated just for you to watch as the next best video to keep your inspiration flowing to keep you evolving to keep you check it out now